Derek Scott, the Assistant Director of Bands here at the University of Southern Mississippi. And this evening, I'm looking forward to sharing with you the story of a composer named Irvin Shuloff. And I'm thrilled to be bringing some of his music to life with the assistance of my friends, colleagues, and students here at the USM School of Music. The most common question I've received since announcing my lecture recital is, what is Intrarch Musik? Intrarch Musik, or Forbidden Music, was a label that the Nazi government used in an attempt to isolate, discredit, and ban musical works by Jewish composers. After the Nazis seized power in 1933, the works of Felix Mendelssohn and Gustav Mahler were disparaged and condemned, along with works by living composers such as Arnold Schoenberg, Paul Hindemith, and Kurt Weill. As the world moved on from World War II, the voices silenced by the Nazi purge received little performance or scholarship, including Irvin Schulhoff. Unfortunately, there were millions of voices that were lost and stories that still remain untold. So that I hope that through sharing the story of Irvin Schulhoff this evening, that you can see some sort of insight into the experiences and the plight of German artists during this time. Artistic freedom is something that we all take for granted, so I hope that this will serve as a reminder for this vital right that ensures the creation of diverse art in our own country. My goal for this recital is to raise awareness for the topic and encourage other musicians to explore music and perform uh, music from this time in history. I believe in our efforts uh, to study diverse repertoire, we must um, consider music from our past, even repertoire from our darker moments. Despite not having the notoriety of other composers in the early 20th century, Irvin Shulov's life intersects one of the most turbulent times in modern history. And his music is worthy of study because of his blend of traditional and popular concert styles. Shulov's musical output was innovative and diverse and his compositional voice was shaped by some of the most prominent voices in classical music, including Antonin Dvorak, Max Reger, and Claude Debussy. He artfully blended his traditional training with American jazz, political satire, and popular dance music, all of which you'll be hearing this evening. A greater understanding of Shulov's music is only possible after a brief examination of the time in which it was written. The Weimar Republic was founded at the end of the First World War amidst political crises, moral confusion, and economic turmoil. The artistic output from this time had flourished as much as it had in Germany for several generations. Although life in Germany tr changed drastically after the First World War, as the country shifted from an empire to a democracy, and as you can see on the map here, from 1914 to 1923, there were whole countries that were created. And in fact, uh, this shift didn't really occur until 1919. So over the span of four years, all of these different countries and democracies were created at the same time. And while this shift produced some, some beautiful artwork, some of which we'll be exploring this evening, the political upheaval and economic instability exacerbated racial tensions in the Weimar Republic that had occurred under the surface for several decades. Mind you, Jewish citizens had earned equal rights in, Jew in German-speaking lands just 50 years before, in 1871. All of these factors would create the environment in which the Nazi party would establish themselves, setting the table for World War II. Dadaism and jazz replaced the romanticism of the old German empire. Dadaist arts often contain collages of mundane items exhibited as artworks because in the artist's view, art was not challenged by reality. Rather, reality was challenged by art. Jazz, the American vernacular music, uh, had become increasingly prominent throughout Europe and encompassed ragtime, blues, and various forms of popular music. And composers began to blur the lines between uh, popular music and, and classical music as uh, as jazz made its way from the nightclub to the concert hall. During the First World War, recordings of the original Dixieland Jazz Band and artists like King Oliver uh, cycled throughout Europe. Following the war, the United States occupied part of the Weimar Republic until 1923 and brought with them American popular music. This all helped to reshape the musical landscape in Weimar overnight. 
the development of the radio, uh, recording uh, technology, uh, and the electronic music all had a profound impact on the music that was being created as well. Czechoslovak radio became the earliest public radio broadcaster in continental Europe when it began operations in May of 1923. Radios began broadcasting sports, political addresses, and musical performances much like they do today. And with the increased popularity in radio and advancements in recording technology, composers began c composing pieces specifically for the radio, including both the pieces that you'll hear from Shulop this evening. Born to a Czech Jewish family in Prague in 1894, Shulop's musical talent became evident when he began playing the piano at the age of three. Shulop began his formal musical studies at the Prague Conservatory when he was only 10 years old, where his first role model and teacher was the prominent Czech composer, Antonin Dvorak. Despite his initial reservations about Shulop, Dvorak encouraged his musical studies and piano and composition. Shulop later recounted their first encounter. He said, Dvorak did not receive us all too accommodatingly. He did not love child prodigies and confronted talent which appeared prematurely without trust. He did not believe that it would pr produce a sincere musician. He refused to deal with me. Mother, however, did not let herself be so easily disposed of. She didn't want to have a prodigy as a son, but rather sought to justify me in, uh, in teaching me in music. Dvorak ordered me, perhaps to get rid of the discomfort of the visit, to stand with my forehead against the wall and he seated himself at the piano. He played a note, said, what's this? I guessed it correctly. He played another note and in another pitch. And again, I correctly named the pitches. Dvorak, obviously taken in at this point, began to play a melody. First of all, a simple one, then one with two voices, and finally with chords. I determined the range of the, of the pitches as they followed each other. This game lasted a full five, perhaps 10 minutes, and finally Dvorak stopped, got up from the piano, and I also turned around from the wall, and he observed me for a while with an examining eye. He was silent. Then he walked over to his desk, opened a drawer, took something out, said, take this, and handed me a package. And inside were two chocolate bars. Thus Dvorak promoted me to the status of a musician. At 15 years old, he traveled to Leipzig, where he met and studied composition with Max Rager, the famed pedagogue in music theory and composition at the Prague Conservatory. Max Rager was a huge advocate for modern music and championed works uh, by Paul Hindemith, Arthur Honegger, and Gustav Mahler. At the age of 18, he left his country and traveled to Paris in hopes of convincing Debussy to, to uh, accept him as a private composition student. He moved there not knowing if he was actually going to get to study with him or not. And despite his anticipated mentorship with the famed French pedagogue, the tutelage was not what Shulop had in mind. Debussy criticized his use of non-traditional voice leadings and the use of parallel fifths, saying, as long as I'm your teacher, you will learn and preserve the compositional principles certified by century-old practices as correct. Until you leave me and stand compositionally on your own legs, then you can do what you want. Shulop and Debussy soon parted ways, although his earlier works, including his 1913 Piano Sonata No. 2, showed influences of his French teacher. Here's a brief excerpt from a, a remastered recording of Irvin Shulop playing his own piece, Piano Sonata No. 2. <laughs>
The trajectory of world history, along with Chulas' life, changed drastically in 1914 with the start of the First World War. After being dra drafted in the Austro-Hungarian army when the war broke out, Chulak began his military service in Prague on the Eastern Front. He concluded his military assignment in Hungary where he suffered a shrapnel wound to his hand and spent the final months of the war in an Italian prisoner of war camp. Chulak's creative output continued despite all of this and in 1918 he entered the Felix Mendelssohn Composition Contest and won and received his first contract with a publisher. Following the war, in early 1919, Shulaf moved to Dresden to live with his sister Viola, who was a prominent visual artist. Eager to resume creative activities after the war, artists would gather in public spaces and private homes to discuss topics ranging from art, music, and politics, which resulted in some highly creative and innovative artistic movements. The Shulaf household became a, a gathering place for young liberal musicians and painters. All of these collaborations impacted Shulaf drastically. However, it was George Gross that introduced him to a new art movement called Dadaism and some of the first recordings of American jazz. He had an extensive jazz collection. And in fact, if, for the bassist in the room, uh, George Gross's son, Marty Gross, was a famous jazz bassist in the United States in the mid 20th century. And so he had an extensive jazz collection very, very early on and that had a profound impact on uh, on Irvin Shuloff. The visual arts for my, for my lecture this evening all are works by George Gross. Dadaism often contained a collage of mundane items exhibited as artwork. Dadaist artists often maintain leftist political views and express discontent with war, nationalism, and violence through media such as collages, poetry, and sculpture. In the aftermath of the First World War, this anti-war, anti-bourgeois message spread, uh, spread throughout Europe, but it was especially well received in war ravaged by Mar Republic. Here you have an example by George Gross, a painting by George Gross titled Greed, a subtitle Eclipse of the Sun, and it's signaled by the dollar sign. If you look, there's a dollar sign eclipsing the sun in the top left corner of the painting. The artwork depicts the greed and the violence in uh, Germany's military uh, politicians and industrialists. Gross depicts the mindless bureaucrats literally headless suits around the table around a war general with a uh, industrialist carrying weapons whispering in his ear. The donkey represents the German people wearing the blinders of ignorance. This is the kind of collage style painting that's associated with Dadaism and frequently associated with a lot of uh, Dadaist artworks, not just paintings. And of course you have the political satire as well. Very similarly, Dada's music often contained collages of unrelated musical styles, non-musical sound effects like car horns, ratchets, whistles, machines, and musical sound effects like flutter tongues and glissandi, overt political commentary, and musical satire, some of which you're gonna be hearing this evening in the music by Irvin Shuloff in just a moment. Irvin Shuloff's 1926 work, Le Bourgeois Gentle Home, or The Bourgeois Gentleman, is an example of a Dadaist work for chamberwinds. It's based on a 1670 play by the French author Molière. It criticizes the, the idea of social climbing and the bourgeois or the middle class, and also pokes fun at the snobbish aristocracy. According to Molière, a gentleman must be nobly born, meaning that there is no such thing as a bourgeois gentleman. The music consists of an overture and a series of dance scenes in which Shuloff juxtaposes the high art Western classical music with low art popular dances. In addition, the suite has, uh, contains brief music, musical interludes and plenty of uh, elements of musical satire, which you'll hear in just a moment. In early 1926, the director of the National Theater in Prague, Carl Hugo Hiller, needed incidental music for a modern day setting of Malay's drama. Throughout the original drama, Molière critiques the bourgeoisie and the nobility, both of whom are subject to corruption and driven by superficial desire. Hiller, believing that the sentiment would resonate in modern day France, or in modern day Europe, wanted to create a contemporary setting of this theatrical work and set it in Weimar and translated the, German, uh, the text from French to German. After the success, successful production of the play, 
Shuloff set the music to a concert suite in the form that you'll hear this evening. And it was premiered via radio broadcast in 1928 with Shuloff at the piano. The manuscript after that performance was lost and was eventually rediscovered in 1999 in the Museum of Czech uh, Music in Prague. And it was eventually published in just 2006. Now we're going to reset the stage, get a tuning note, and then I will introduce the overture. is set in the home of Mansour Jourdain. He's a middle-aged bourgeois. The foolish Jourdain has one aim in life, to rise above his middle-class background and be accepted as an aristocrat. Other main characters in Act One include a music master and a dancing master, both who've been hired by Jourdain to teach him in the noble arts of music and dance. Although Jourdain consistently makes a fool of himself, the music and the dancing master continue to coach him to avoid losing their salaries. As the overture begins, the music master is guiding a pupil to, to compose a serenade, and the dancing master is completing choreography to accompany the music. Jordan is asleep in the other room, completely unaware of what's going on. The adagio introduction of the overture is the serenade that's being composed. The fast allegro follows the slow introduction and is in sonata allegro form. One can hear the contrast in the song and dance in the two main themes of the allegro, which depict the music master and the dancing master. The six measure introduction at the beginning of the allegro uh, contains a three note motive, C, G, C, and you can hear that throughout the entire overture. It's the building block for the accompaniment throughout the movement. The first theme, which is light and nimble, uh, depicts the dancing master and is first heard in the clarinet and the oboe at measure 26. The slower lyrical second theme is the, um, it depicts the music master and is scored in the clarinet and the bassoon. Tonight there will be some brief introductions in between some of the larger movements, so please hold your applause until the conclusion of the entire suite. Here's the overture followed by the aria.
In the stage work, Dance of the Tailors occurs with Jourdain trying on a custom suit. The master tailor has four apprentices. Yes, he's hired four apprentices and a master tailor. 
to make a ceremony out of him trying on the suit. The opening motive is the building block for the entire movement. In Dance of the Tailors, the motives and melodic fragments are each repeated four times, depicting each one of the apprentices, while the master tailor does some last minute measurements. And speaking of measurements, throughout the movement you'll hear ratchet solos, trombone glissandi, ascending and descending lines, all depicting the sound of the tape measure. Dance of the Tailors contains a variety of unique color combinations, including English horn, bass clarinet, contrabassoon, and yes, the ratchet, to create an atmosphere of musical satire. Here is Dance of the Tailors, followed by the Sicilian. Thank <laughs> you. 
Throughout the bourgeois gentleman, Shulov juxtaposes high art Western classical music with low art popular music, including in the banquets, which consist of a fugato or a short fugue composed in the style of a foxtrot. The beginning of the banquet is not notated otaguf a la foxtrot, indicating that Shulov constructed the otaguf or fugato, spelled backwards, in retrograde, saving the statement and the answer that you would normally hear at the beginning of a fugue for the end of the fugue. Here's the subject of the fugue played in the trumpet. Not your average Bach. So there's, uh, he alters the subject through diminution, augmentation, and inversion, which is typical for a fugue. If you listen carefully, you can hear the, the four quarter note initiation of the subject throughout the entire, the entire piece. Uh, the march immediately follows the banquet and consists of a progression of melodies in trumpet, oboe, and xylophone to accompany the arrival of the man that Jordan thinks is the son of the Turkish Sultan. It's really not, it's his, his daughter's boyfriend who's dressed as the son of the Turkish Sultan to try to trick Jordan into allowing him to marry his daughter. So here is the banquet and the march followed by the Napolitana.
In the grand final ballet, Jordan oversees a parade of his teachers to honor the fake, dignified Turkish guest. The movement begins with a brief introduction followed by the Commedia dell'arte, or the comedy of art, which is a type of theatrical scene that's meant to seem improvised, where actors perform clever pantomimes and acrobatic feats and comical interjections. The theme for the comedy of art is brisk and lively and characterized a lot of shifting accents, and you'll hear it in the trombone, and then it's passed around the rest of the ensemble. The movement contains a, a diverse collage of different art forms, uh, both traditional and popular, including a tango, a march, a pastoral, a waltz, as philosophers, artists, ballerinas, musicians, and even boxers process in the parade for the dignified Turkish guests. The suite concludes with a, turn, a return of the theme of the comedy of art, which helps to unify the stylistic changes and bring the work to a close. We hope that you enjoy this final movement of the suite of the bourgeois gentleman. Following the end of the suite, we'll take a brief intermission and reset for the second half.
Throughout the 1920s and early 1930s, Shulof's career as a pianist, composer, and teacher began to flourish. He started his teaching career at the Prague Conservatory in 1923 for piano, and his role in the conservatory expanded in 1929 to include composition. With radio broadcasts spanning from London to Prague, his name became prominent throughout Europe as a respected performer of both traditional and popular music. His concert appearances included critically acclaimed residencies at uh, Paris and in London in 1927, and the premiere of his Concerto for Piano and Orchestra with the Royal Concertgebouw in Amsterdam, with Schulhoff playing at the piano. In the spring of 1933, the Nazi party presented a series of exhibits called Degenerate Art, with the premise of denouncing and stigmatizing most modern works. Despite attempts at, to clarify what was classified as degenerate art, the regime, regime's definition remained unclear until the mid-1930s when he began targeting work specifically by Jewish artists. Music was also a target in the assault on artistic freedoms as the Nazi party leaders began a campaign to align politics, society, culture, and art with Nazi ideology. Music that upheld the standards of conventional beauty and conveyed the values of militarism, racial purity, and heroism were exalted. Works depicting the horrors of war, corruption, and brutality experienced in the regime were explicitly for forbidden. The party disparaged well-known Jewish composers Felix Mendelssohn, Gustav Mahler, and Arnold Schoenberg, citing them all as anti-German. While fellow composers Paul Hindemith, Kurt Weill, and Ernst Krenick escaped persecution, persecution and immigrated to the United States, Irvin Shuloff relocated his family to his homeland of Czechoslovakia. As the Nazi army invaded Czechoslovakia, they continued their assault on artistic freedoms. In the greater German Reich, the government continued to exert complete control over every avenue of free thought, from press, radio and cinema, to theater, churches, and even academic institutions. This control was executed through the Reich Chamber of Culture, which oversaw the production of all arts, including film, theater, and music in Nazi-controlled lands. By the late 1930s, membership in the Reich Chamber of Culture was required for employment in professional ensembles and academic institutions. Artists wishing to become members were required to prove their Aryan ancestry. Because Irvin Shuloff couldn't prove his Aryan ancestry, he was ineligible for membership, and thus he lost his decade-long teaching post at the Prague Conservatory. After losing employment at the Prague Conservatory, Shuloff feared capture and began the immigration process. Although other composers, such as Arnold Schoenberg and Paul Hindemith, were able to expedite their immigration uh, process due to their established international reputations, Shuloff's paperwork was denied, and after losing employment, his financial means were limited. He eventually began the process of immigrating to the Soviet Union. To generate income and to support his family, Shulop began producing many popular jazz pieces for the radio and began serving uh, using several different pseudonyms for his engagements. Unfortunately, this was extremely common for Jewish artists at the time to pick an Aryan-sounding name just so they could continue their livelihood and continue making art. In 1941, Shulof received his Soviet citizenship for his family and began the process of immigrating. But his immigration status came too late. As Shulof made plans to leave, Hitler violated the non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union and invaded on June 22, 1941, making it impossible for Shulof to leave Czechoslovakia. Despite having his petition for citizenship approved, he was arrested and imprisoned the next day after the invasion before he could escape. Shulof was initially held in the Prague YMCA before being deported to the concentration camp in Wolfsburg, Bavaria. While fellow Czech composers, Pavel Haas, Gideon Klein, and Viktor Ullmann, all of whom are worthy of study and music is, is certainly worth studying as well, uh, those composers were arrested for their Jewish ethnicity. Shulof was placed in a camp specifically for Soviet citizens. 
Despite his imprisonment, Shulaf continued to compose, including piano sketches of the Seventh Symphony while being detained in Prague, and sketches of his Eighth Symphony while being imprisoned in Wolfsburg. Before his work could be complete, Shulaf caught tuberculosis and died August 28, 1942. He was buried in a straw bag in an unmarked grave outside of Wolfsburg concentration camp. When Erwin Shulaf was approved for immigration, he shipped much of his music to the Soviet Union, allowing his compositions to survive the Nazi purge. Diplomacy after the end of the Cold War allowed further research into music from this time period. And with the 50th anniversary of the Second World War, just a few years later, music from the Weimar Republic saw a resurgence in scholarship. And today, through scholarship and research, the music from composers like Urban Shirloff are being performed again for the first time in several generations. Shulaf's musical legacy includes six complete symphonies, an opera, pieces, uh, chamber pieces for solo violin, flute, bassoon, a sextet for winds and piano, a number of string quartets, and several works for piano, and a variety of pieces that are traditionally written and uh, influenced by popular music. One of his most valuable contributions was in the realm of jazz-influenced concert works. Arguably, no other European composer in the 1920s dedicated himself more to incorporating uh, jazz in concert works than Erwin Schulhoff. His involvement in jazz for the decades that followed World War I attests to his appreciation for jazz as a musical aesthetic and a rebellious cultural movement. Mind you, there was a rebellious cultural movement with jazz, associated with jazz here in the United States. Hindemith and Mio experimented with jazz in concert works by 1920 and two in 1923. However, Shulaf incorporated elements in his works as early as 1919 upon his return from the war. Shulaf credited himself with the creation of what he called art jazz. As you, he said, as you see, I was the first to succeed with art jazz. Compare the dates of origin and you'll discover that the other composers followed me. I certainly admit that I've refrained from prospering from this, but for me, the fact that I still hold the lead in this direction is enough for me. Here's a recording of Tango from Five Jazz Etudes, first written in 1919 for piano and later arranged for chamber ensemble. This work is performed by an ensemble called the Ebony Band, and the Ebony Band is a wonderful resource. They, they have dedicated a lot of their time and energy over the past several decades in creating recordings of works from this time period. Uh, so if you're interested in finding out more about music from this time period, the Ebony Band is a great resource to check out. Here is Tango from Five Jazz Etudes.
Irvin Schulau's 1930 work, Hot Sonata, for saxophone and piano, was among one of the first compositions to elevate the jazz saxophone from the Weimar nightclubs to the concert halls. In fact, this sonata is one of the first saxophone sonatas, period, let alone one for jazz. It exemplifies Schulau's skill in utilizing American jazz in concert works. The Berlin Radio commissioned the work, which received its premiere by American saxophonist Billy Barton, with Schulau playing at the piano. Barton created one of the first swing bands in the Weimar Republic and had an exceptional high register for the time. Shuloff utilizes the high register in a very purposeful manner in this piece. As Shuloff noted, only musicians like Barton can play Masonata. The work incorporates a jazz vernacular, including rhythmic grooves, syncopation, jazz harmonies, and scales, including the blues and the whole tone scale, into a traditional form of the sonata. In 2002, composer Richard Rodney Bennett transcribed Hot Sonata for orchestral winds, percussion, and string bass in the version that you'll be hearing tonight. The first movement is constructed in ternary form with two contrasting themes. And again, rhythm plays a very critical role in the construction of the movement, particularly in drawing contrast to the smooth, lyrical, flowing nature of the first theme and the biting rhythms of the second. Titled Vivo, the second movement is upbeat and contains more musical dialogue between the soloist and the ensemble and even includes a shout chorus in the ensemble. The movement is constructed in a modified strophic form, which is a popular music dance uh, musical form, um, and consists of two themes. The melodic material utilizes the blues scale. Marked lament, but very grotesque. The third movement is slow and expressive lyrical blues ballad, and it has some grit to it. Uh, you probably haven't been to a Weimar nightclub uh, playing jazz, but you've probably been to one in New Orleans. It's similar. The smears and the staccatos in the primary theme stand out in contrast to the staccato uh, notes in the accompaniment. The theme alternates in varying episodes, again, similar to a verse refrain. And uh, the final statement of the primary theme in includes a very uh, more elaborate improvisatory feel in the saxophone. And speaking of improvisation, there is no improvisation in the saxophone solo. It sounds improvised, but it's all written down. The fourth movement is a driving finale in ternary form and it's constructed in a 16 bar um, phrases. The movement contains melodic material indicative of the blues scale and uses ex extensive syncopation and cross rhythms. There's a lot of rhythmic grooves in this last movement. Shulov creates thematic unity in the sonata by incorporating the primary theme of the first movement in the middle of, this, of the last movement, which again is a very classical idea. The driving rhythms return uh, from the slower section to bring the work to a climatic ending. If you'd like to know more about Entrecht Music, feel free to check out some of these resources here. You can scan the QR code. The QR code is also on the back of the program. For those who are joining us virtually, you can also check out um, the virtual program, and that will have um, a QR code for the links as well. Uh, one thing that I would like to point out, at least for the musicians in the room, uh, the Forbidden Music link at the very top, if you go there, they have a search engine that you can go through and you can search specific pieces for particular instruments. So if you want to know a flute piece, a bassoon piece, viola, um, various pieces of chamber works, uh, woodwind quintets, string quartets, other things, that's a wonderful, wonderful resource. And a lot of these pieces are either IMSLP or if you have to purchase them, they go towards organizations that help with scholarship and research in this area. So it's money well spent. Um, and again, of course, you're more than welcome to ask me questions as well. I'd like to welcome our special guests uh, that have joined us this evening from the synagogue in Hattiesburg. I would like to especially thank uh, Nick and Rachel Seraldo for extending the, the welcome uh, to those. Welcome to the School of Music. Thank you for joining us this evening. As many of you know, this is a culminating event for uh, my DMA at Northwestern. I will not be Dr. Scott after this evening, but it's gonna be a huge step in that direction, and I'm immensely grateful for a lot of people uh, in this room that have helped to make that necessary. Uh, first off, my wonderful students and colleagues, some of them are making music with me today, some are here to support in, in the audience. Uh, thank you so much for making this a wonderful, wonderful home here since I arrived last year. 
to my family, thank you so much for all your unconditional love and support and helping me every step of the way from being, um, from starting beginning bands to having this crazy idea of going off to grad school and moving all over the place and doing all the things you were there to support me and, and I couldn't do this without you. I love you guys and thank you so much. To Dr. Thompson, my uh, DMA conducting teacher, I, I can't thank you enough. Uh, thank you so much for seeing the potential in me that I didn't always see in myself and for continuing to push me and motivate me to become the best version of myself that I can be. To Dr. Vondren, thank you so much for your mentorship uh, throughout my DMA and for helping to edit my document. For Professor Steve Davis, my master's teacher, you are one of the most passionate musicians and teachers that I've ever met in my, my life and have had such an impact on me since studying with you and I hope that I can have the same kind of impact on my students that you've had on me. Thank you so much. And last and certainly not least, I'd like to thank Noah. Thank you so much for your, your patience and your unwavering support through all of this. Uh, there's been a lot of shulaf going on in our household over the past couple of months, as you could probably imagine. Both me talking about shulaf, him reading shulaf, him playing shulaf, me conducting shulaf, there's a lot of shulaf. So um, I can't imagine a better person to be on this journey with. Thank you so much, and I love you. At this time, we're going to take a, a quick uh, shift of scenery here, um, move up the, the screen. They're going to play a few notes. We'll get a tuning note, and then I'll introduce our soloist. I've had the pleasure of collaborating with some wonderful, wonderful musicians here. Our professor of saxophone is no exception to that. He is a wonderful educator, an amazing human being, and he's also helped me a lot with the technology up here and navigating all that. If you know anything about me, technology is not my strong suit. Um, and Dr. Espinoza has been a wonderful, wonderful resource in helping me get this together, and he is a an amazing, amazing musician, as you're about to hear. Can you please welcome to the stage our soloist, our professor of saxophone, Dr. Danelle Espinoza.
Support me, you're more than welcome to come join us. We'd love to see you outside the music building for a little bit. 